Hey everyone, welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Witten, and today I have with me Jay Campbell, who is an international best-selling author, founder of the TOT Revolution, that's Testosterone Optimization Therapy, and a global evangelist teaching men, women, and their doctors how to optimize their hormones, their life, and their happiness. He's a no-nonsense, authentic, and in-your-face guy, <laughs> in, in, and I can attest to that personally because I met him in, in person. Uh, in a day and age when being hyper masculine is frowned upon, and he's going to give us the scoop on hormone optimization. So, welcome, my friend. Such a pleasure. Oh, man, it's a blessing to be here. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, it's 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 been a long time coming. I wanted to do this about a year ago. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. It's great to finally do it. So, um, and and I highly recommend reading uh, his his book to everybody watching this. Uh, it's the TOT Bible. You can you can. Uh, get it on Amazon and it's pretty much the best resource in the world available to, uh, to people on the subject of testosterone and optimizing testosterone levels. So that, uh, that is the subject of today's podcast. So first of all, let's kind of go big picture here, Jay, for, you know, for everybody listening who knows nothing about testosterone, you know, the, we're not talking to like the biohacking crowd here who's already kind of up to date on the latest science around testosterone and maybe they've measured their levels and they're, they're tracking things and they're, they're, they know nothing about this whole subject. So talk to me about what testosterone optimization is all about and why there is an epidemic of testosterone deficiency. So it's a great question. Again, first off, thank you, <clears throat> Ari. It's an honor to be here, man. Um, I think the world of you, you know, I've done some amazing stuff. As you know, you and I are going to be doing a live webinar after my podcast with you today about all the things that you're involved with. So again, honor to be here. In, re in regards to the question, um, it's amazing how many men today and women, and that's a whole other subject, but have hormonal um, deficiencies due to the environment due to what I call the war on our biological systems, um, and then also just due to being inactive, um, you know, sedentary, not getting out in the sun, not connecting with nature, and all the things, again, that, you know, you write about. Um, and, and, and hence, because they have an, a, a lack of awareness, um, they just go through life by the time they hit 40, 45, 50. And, 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 and by the way, a lot of these guys now are experiencing this even in their 20s. Um, their life massively declines because, as you know, when you do not have, uh, you know, at least I would say normal to, normal to, and we want to be an optimal, but normal levels of testosterone, everything declines. Physical health, body fat levels creep up, you know, you get brain cog, you get a lack of cognition. I mean, on and on it goes. And unfortunately, most men today who do seek out, you know, treatment or help, and, my, and most of the time, Ori, it's because their wives tell them, you need to go see a doctor because they're not able to get or maintain firm erections anymore. Their doctors do not help them. And unfortunately, they don't help them for a couple of reasons, but primarily because they are attempting as doctors in a crazy day and age today, what I call now sick care or illness medicine, um, to make money. And the only way they're going to make money is to prescribe an SSRI inhibitor, as you know, which is a mood altering medication. And or, and it's usually in combination, uh, erectile dysfunction medication, right? Like a Cialis or Vi a Viagra or Levitra. So those two drugs ultimately will, you know, medicate the person, the man who came to the doctor's symptoms, but they won't treat the root cause, which is usually a testosterone deficiency. So we've come to a day and age now where the majority of men in society today have no clue that they need to even have their testosterone levels looked at. And then secondarily, they, they struggle to actually get, you know, fair and accurate treatment because the average doctor isn't even going to go down that path. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So what, what's actually causing this? What's, what's going on? You, you talked about a war on our biological system. So what is actually responsible for why there is sort of an epidemic of testosterone deficiency? And why is it sort of happening now? Like, why aren't humans programmed to have plenty of testosterone? And you know what's what's going on in the modern world that's that's resulting in this. It's a great question, and and, and truthfully, you know the book, the TOT Bible. And by the way, anyone who watches your podcast today, I do this for every podcast I'm on. If they email my team, it's contact at trtrevolution. 
um, com. We'll send you a PDF of the TRT Bible absolutely free. So just send an email again, TRT, I mean, excuse me, contact at trtrevolution.com. But the question is a good one. Um, if we go back 60 to 80 years and we look at the men of the World War I, World War II, and the Korean War generation, they literally had between two and four times higher levels of natural testosterone pulsing through their bodies than men of today. And there are studies that can back that up. Um, and again, they're all quoted in my book and people can look into those. And I always mention you know, one good study to look at, which is called the Hebrew University Study. Um, which actually looked at men on all the continents, and it was like a forty, a thirty-nine thousand male population cohort group wow. um, of where they are from a fertility standpoint. And we are seeing a, as you said already, a global deficiency and almost a collapse of fertility in men um, because of declining testosterone levels. But it's what I would assume, and again, I write about this in the books, and I obviously interview some of the top doctors and clinicians in the world about this. It's mostly due to modern day living, right? I'm wearing blue light blocking glasses right now because the light that's being emitted from my computer screen, as well as the white, you know, the high intensity lights that come down from, you know, our offices and stuff like that. And even, you know, stage lighting that I have in my background for my podcasts, um, that causes harm to our endocrine system. Um, plastic, right? Receipts, cell phones, you know, this stuff, this, you know, here's the newest Apple uh, case, this is military grade polymer high resin plastic that when it touches your cuticle, you know, is doing all kinds of things going into, your, again, your biological systems, you know, cross-linking. I mean, there's so many things that happen to us now in this modern commercialized age. You know, we have endocrine disrupting chemicals. You know, I always grab this book and talk about this. You know, Dr. Anthony Jay, who wrote this book, Estro Generation, every person should read this book because it's very, very horrifying to really be aware of this kind of stuff, but it's important so that you can be proactive and try to avoid some of these things. But it's impossible nearly today, um, Ori, to completely naturally optimize yourself unless you're extremely proactive. And all of these things, again, are leading to uh, what I call attack on our biological systems. And in that attack on our biological systems are endocrine systems. And by the way, this isn't just men, this is women too are not functioning at peak capacity. And as soon as they stop functioning at peak capacity, um, and again, it's a synergy, right? Everything is a big circle, your thyroid, your testosterone, your pancreas, insulin, all these things, when one breaks down, it usually leads to malfunctioning at all the other areas. So it's like, you really have to be proactive by, as you and I were talking off the air, measuring your blood testosterone levels, measuring your thyroid hormone levels, measuring your A1C and your blood glucose levels, measuring all these things that are being attacked due to, again, modern day societal living. Yeah, I want, I want to dig a little deeper into this topic. So you talk a, a lot about uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, have, I'm curious, have you looked into, I have a bunch of things I want to ask about, but sure. uh, diet. At all, so is is there a role for just the modern food environment as a as a causal factor in low testosterone levels, and also uh, circadian rhythm and sleep? Are are you aware of how that relates to uh, testosterone levels as well? So yes, yeah, so it's great questions. So they are number one and number two, and honestly, you could invert the order based on the person's condition, right? So it's it's kind of a chicken or egg um, scenario with. Does testosterone, is testosterone caused by metabolic disorder or obesity, or does obesity and metabolic disorder causes testosterone deficiency? The top doctors in the world, which I'm very blessed to usually be able to hobnob with and connect with and work with, um, all say that it really doesn't matter because it's one or the other. So if you have, if you're obese and you're eating a, sh you know, can I swear on your podcast? <laughs> I'm sure some, some small subset of people will be offended, but feel free. <laughs> so if you eat an SHIT diet, yes, then all those, you know, again, the chemicals from GMO food, from engineered food, um, those things are obviously not digestible in the way that God intended our bodies to digest food. Um, so the reality is, is that, yes, I mean, essentially eating terribly, um, you know, gaining, um, Oh, you know, visceral fat um, due to eating terribly and then also not sleeping. And I, I, I think, again, they all kind of go hand in hand because when your diet is terrible 
you have a bunch of food, especially, you know, a typical guy, right? He comes home, he's not eating well, he eats a bunch of food, he has like this gigantic insulin bomb in his gut, and then the average bro or guy will then, you know, drink three or four beers or a couple glasses of wine or even soda or whatever, and then they're laying there in bed at night. And obviously their, you know, their microbiome is completely disrupted. They have some form of dysbiosis and they're just laying there unable to sleep, right? So if you look at, and again, Dr. Anthony Jay is really big on understanding polyphasic sleep. And, you know, if you, I don't know if you're familiar with the aura ring and stuff, you know, if you have an aura ring, you can track it. There's obviously all kinds of, you know, biotech out there now today that you can track this kind of stuff, but no question that sleep or lack thereof is the first, you know, caveat or the first anvil to drop when a person starts to suffer and again when i say suffer i mean a testosterone deficiency a lack of thyroid production obviously complete insulin um, insensitivity so it's like they, you know they they can't eat any kind of carbohydrates or eat any kind of sugar it just immediately goes and deposits in their stubborn fat uh you know resistant sites so it's a great question you definitely must optimize sleep and you must attempt to optimize your diet I do think, though, that if you're at a certain age and you have too much visceral fat already deposited on your body, it's going to be really, really hard to go the, the natural uh, means of you know, doing everything natural through natural optimization without you know, concurrently or concomitantly attempting to utilize a therapeutic dosage of testosterone because testosterone is lipolytic. It does enhance uh, BMR, basic metabolic rate. It can increased natural thyroid production so there's a lot of things that it can do to help um but yeah i mean you know that's like one of the things i always talk about and of course that's heavily discussed in the book and i'm actually working on two more books right now about around this um, and the key is always you must mediate through natural means before you ever attempt the therapeutic or clinical you know um, attack which would be using therapeutic testosterone it's very very important but again I counterbalance it with the idea that there's so much obesity out there that, you know, you kind of have to look at everybody individually. Yeah. I want to come back to that point uh, that you just said about, you, you know, optimizing nutrition and lifestyle before using testosterone. Absolutely. But, but first I, I want to talk about like kind of th this whole subject is somewhat taboo. It's been yeah. a little bit you know, to talk <laughs> about, think? to talk about testosterone, to talk about testosterone re replacement therapy or optimization um, why is that? And why do you think that it's misguided to demonize it? Man, I really wish I knew the answer. I mean, I talk about it all the time. Um, you know, I've written about it in both of my books. Um, I personally believe, and again, talk to way smarter people than me, like Rick Collins, you know, who's kind of like the guy in the legal industry who represents major league baseball and NFL and pro bodybuilders and all this stuff. If you talk to him and I happen to be very blessed that I talk to him on a regular basis, um, you know, he says it's just another attack um, on people from a money management standpoint, meaning that, you know, because again, go, let's go back. 1990, um, anabolic steroids were legal, okay? There were men in gyms all across the world that would literally use testosterone, and I could name a million other anabolic steroids, and they would work, use these to obviously build up their physiques for whatever reason. Some of them were competing, some of them just did it for, you know, cosmetic purposes, some of them did it for narcissistic purposes, whatever. And then the government got involved um, right after the whole Ben Johnson, if you remember the Ben Johnson track and field thing in the Olympics, which was in the late 80s, I think it was 1988. Um, and that kind of made all of this taboo. When I say all of this, just the idea that men and women um, can utilize therapeutic testosterone for medicinal reasons, uh, you know, obviously for re reducing aging or slowing aging. And that's kind of the definition. When I speak about this, wherever ever it is, or I do podcasts on, you know, mainstream outlets and stuff like that, I always tell people when they ask me, what is testosterone optimization therapy? And I says, it's utilizing therapeutic testosterone to slow the process of aging. And then they're like, well, what the hell does that mean? And the reality is, is that, as you know, testosterone is the molecule, is the lifeblood molecule of human biological systems. I mean, again, it, it's the sex differentiator for both men and women. Um, you know, optimized levels of testosterone pro produce all kinds of amazing uh, biological benefits and therapeutic benefits. It, you know, they increases, again, brain power, cognition, uh, muscle, uh, you know, upregulates ATP. I mean, it does so many things. It obviously also um, redu uh, reduces, uh, you know, the um, synaptic um, gunk 
and, uh, and, and, and stuff and break down. So, I mean, it, because again, they know that now that, you know, Dr. Mark Gordon, you know, works with a lot of the um, ex-military guy, or not ex-military, but just, you know, guys that have been um, in, in blast situations. You know, he's been doing a lot of research with some people at USC and they know now that testosterone actually creates neural and forms new neural pathways in the brain. So it does so many amazing things. So it's like, if you can work with somebody who's been managing male and female endocrine systems for a long time as a doctor, giving therapeutic testosterone, you will see the amazing benefits that can happen. And to your question again, we can't confuse the super physiologic levels that professional bodybuilders and professional athletes and performance enthusiasts use for enhancement versus what, you know, I'm all about, which is again, you're using a very, very micro dose. You know, I always say the MED principle from Tim Ferriss, right? The minimum effective dose, which is what therapeutic testosterone is again, to slow the aging process, to have more vitality, to have more energy, to have better fat burning, to have more uh, power when you're in the gym, obviously to perform better sexually. So there's so many good things about it. And I just think that, you know, the mainstream media being who the mainstream media is, which, you know, what sells, like what most people say is like, what sells is fear, right? If it bleeds, it leads. So I've always kind of thought that testosterone was this taboo, quote unquote, dirty little subject, because when the United States Senate got involved in classifying steroids as controlled three substances, for, again, most people think, Rick Collins included, that it was Ben Johnson because of that giant media sensation it made, that they really, it was just a way to control, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, financial benefits of the market as it is around the world. Because again, you can always still write a script for many um, anabolic steroids. It just had to be, you know, documented and authenticated and of course authorized by a physician. But it's just, it's bizarre because, you know, as Rick Collins will say, um, Ori, nobody has ever died of an overdose from testosterone. And, you know, sure, there have been tons of pro bodybuilders have died from who God knows what, you know, what I call it, you know, polypharmacy of multiple drugs, both steroids and recreational. But you don't see people like dying in the street from like a heroin overdose from a testosterone overdose. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I want to zoom out for a minute. Um, sure. Let's, let's talk about what are the key signs and symptoms of testosterone deficiency and um, what kind of lab results on blood tests would indicate someone as having a deficiency um, and kind of distinguish between sort of the typical lab ranges that you might see and what many people who are experts in this subject consider more optimal ranges. So kind of start with the, maybe start with the lab test numbers and then go into the, the key symptoms for people who are listening who haven't ha who don't know their numbers, what are some of the signs and symptoms that might indicate testosterone deficiency? Awesome, um, good, great questions. So the first uh, measurement numbers that you want to be aware of, and by the way, you don't need a doctor, okay, or uh, you don't need your doctor's recommendation. You can go online. There are multiple independent labs now. There's and, I, and again, I have no sponsorship or I don't get paid by any of these people, but I always just say different names. Um, discountedlabs.com, privatemdlabs.com, directlabs.com. You do not need a doctor's permission. You can go on there. You can order, um, a t you know, for most men to, to find out right away, you can order a total testosterone, a free testosterone, and a sensitive estradiol, which is an LCMS, um, which is liquid chromatography pool. And those three labs are anywhere with a coupon from $39 to like retail 69 or 75 bucks, depending on the lab, okay? You pay, you go online, you just pay, you then take the lab rec form, they email it to you, you print it out, and you just take it to your local lab corp or your local Quest Diagnostics and you get it done, and then they email your results within three to five days. And then you kind of know. But so what you want to measure is you want to measure uh, total testosterone, free testosterone, and just to, so you understand the difference, free testosterone is the actual bioavailable testosterone that's, that's basically available to your body. Um, it's the difference between um, what is testosterone, the, t the total testosterone level, which is the, the bound testosterone, which is not all usable. So the free level, or what, when you monitor that number, is actually more important because the higher the free, the more your body is actually able to utilize the testosterone you have in your body. But you still want to look at total and you want to look at free. And then you want to look at sensitive estradiol, which is the measurement of your estrogen in your body. Now, some of the newest research, which I've been heavily pushing to the world, is the reality that males do not need to block or suppress estrogen. And I don't want to rabbit hole here, but 
Yeah, no, I, I want to talk about that. I have that on okay, my Okay, yeah, we'll get to that. But men need a very healthy level of estrogen in their body because estrogen is a pleiotropic hormone. And estrogen is actually more responsible as a mediator for biological system health than even testosterone is. Okay, so it was in the past that people used to think you needed to block testosterone, your estrogen when you were on testosterone. It's the total opposite of that. We'll get back to that. Um, it's, it's critically important that men have an understanding um, of where their testosterone levels are as they're aging. I say, and again, this is all my book, um, and again, it's totbible.com. You can pick it up on Amazon, or I'll email you the copy of the book. But I say that men should start having their testosterone measured at 25. Now, if you're a 17 or 18-year-old kid and you're obese and you don't, you're not active, you should go get your testosterone done too. I mean, I had you know, my non-biological son, Evan, and soon my other non-biological son, Ezra, I pull their testosterone. I look at their levels, you know, because again, there's a lot of kids today, video game players, inactive people who do not eat well, do not treat their bodies well, do not get outside and get natural sunlight, who have low levels. So again, these are things to know of, but in how, how general old? recommendation, 25. Okay. That's what, at 25 is when you should go get your test done. And again, I think personally, um, depending on how you feel, once a year. I have all my labs since I was kicked in the testicles at 29, um, since then in a file cabinet, <laughs> well, the last five years it's on my desktop now, but I mean, I have literally a file cabinet with all my mat, my lab measurement numbers so I can go back and I can look at deviations and whatnot. But yeah, that's real, really- real quick, I, want to, I want to interrupt you because some people sure. might, might not get why you just mentioned that you got kicked in the testicles and why that's relevant. Sure. Uh, so just explain that really quick. Yeah, so I was playing basketball in an adult men's league when I was 29 years old and I got kicked. And I went to the doctor about two and a half months later because I started feeling really run down. I had like low back problems and just, I just felt terrible. And I was very, very lucky that I was recommended by the PPO doctor, you know, from my company to an endocrinologist. And the endocrinologist ran my, te my testosterone levels. And he's like, dude, you have 220 or whatever it was. Like you have a, you know, the testosterone levels of a, of a geriatric. You know, I work with men on this. I can give you a therapeutic level of testosterone and get you right back to normal. It'll be great. So I went home. My wife at that time, I said, hey, look, this guy's really smart. He was a Harvard-educated guy, by the way. Um, and I said, I trust him. Are you okay with me doing this? She's like, yeah, sure. You know. So anyway, like six to eight weeks later, I felt amazing. And then I became like a just total science nerd because I was always a science nerd, but I really wanted to find out more about this. And you know, he was like, when he got me back to normal, he was like, okay, I can put you on HCG and take you off. And I'm like, dude, I'm not going off. <laughs> like, I don't want to ever not feel like this again, right? It's like, you know, I felt like Superman. And so anyway, you know, the fast forward in the next 10 years, 12 years, I became a total dork of this. This was back in 1999. Um, and I studied it and I found everything that I could find, you know, both like online, underground. There wasn't a lot. You know, there was Nelson Virgil's book. Actually, his first book wasn't even out yet, um, Testosterone in a Man's Guide. But he did have Built to Survive, which was his struggle and his story on surviving HIV. And then from him, I met other people and I started reading like Dan Duchesne stuff. And then I read people like in Russia and Bulgaria that had been translated to English. You know, they had been using therapeutic testosterone with their athletes. So flash forward about 10 to 12 years, I became very studious, very knowledgeable about this. And my friends in the industry that I was in at the time were like, dude, you need to write a book about this. Because people would always see me and they'd be like, dude, how do you look so good? You know? And I'd be like, hey, I use therapeutic testosterone. I was always very, very transparent about it. And they were like, really? You know, and then, you know, you get the confusion in the looks and you're like, what the hell does that mean? You're on steroids or whatever. Um, but eventually I did write a book. And obviously the first book, which was the TRT manual, came out and should have come out in 2014, but it came out in 2015. It was definitely a huge hit. It's still the number one selling book ever, which it's not nothing as good as the, the, the Bible um, because it's so much more comprehensive. But, you know, it established me and allowed me to build all these amazing relationships that I have with doctors now. And then I obviously now I do a bunch of consulting with them and travel around the world and, you know, speak now about it. So it's, um, it's, it's, you know, create, it's come out of nowhere. You know, I was always just a sales and marketing guy. And now in the last five years, this has kind of like become a niche world now for me. And I, and obviously I love it. I mean, I'm very passionate about it. Yeah. You know, as you said in my bio that I sent you, my, I'm a real evangelist about this, but um, men need to understand in today's day and age what they're working with. Because again, if you don't, it can creep up on you so fast. I mean, I work with so many guys who are ex-pro athletes, ex, you know, major go-getters in their life. And all of a sudden, you know, they hit a wall at 34, 35. They stop, you know, for whatever happens, they stop training, they stop eating right, you know, age catches up with them and boom. 
it's like a whirlwind. So again, it's, it's about aware, awareness. And so you really have to make sure that you know your levels and then you obviously try to modulate through optimal, you know, natural means. And if natural means don't you know, work, you need to work with, or you should at least attempt to work with like one of the best doctors out there. Yeah. So real quick, can you list off some of the key signs and symptoms? That's oh yeah, my bad. So the number one symptom of a deficiency is brain fog. And most men do not know that. Most men think it's like, you know, associated with sexual dysfunction or lack of erections or something like that. Not, a cl not even close. The number one symptom and side effect of a testosterone deficiency is brain fog. And how does that present or associate? It's normally uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. The guy just wants to go home and take a nap. He has zero energy. It's just like, wow, I'm not here. What's going on with me? And then after that would be the kind of things you know about, you know, lack of energy, no, no want or, or drive to go to the gym. Um, you know, sex becomes an afterthought, lack of morning wood. Um, but that's, it's no, most men notice it cognitively. There's just a total decline by middle of the day where they have no brain function, have no energy. Like, you know, again, it's, it's mostly like, I just want to take a nap. You know, and a lot of guys, when they get really low, Ari, they're dead. I mean, literally, they don't want to wake up in the morning. They don't want to go to work. They don't want to be married. They don't want to be a father to their children. So it's, you know, I, I like to say, use that term. It's very much a soul crushing diagnosis. Um, if, if you're blessed and lucky enough to even get it diagnosed, because again, most men who do end up going to the doctor, they never even have this treated. They get put on an SSRI like Wellbutrin. Um, you know, or some, there's a million other ones or, you know, Viagra or whatever. And then they just get worse because by the way, and this is sad, and I don't really talk about this a lot on um, shows, but there's now research coming out that all of the SSRIs actually lower testosterone further. Mm -hmm. So it's making it worse. Yeah. Yikes. Crazy. So obviously as far as benefits of testosterone optimization therapy, uh, it, we would expect it to undo some of those symptoms that you just mentioned. Yes. What, what are some of the key physiological mechanisms of how testosterone actually works in our bodies? I mean, it's sort of its role in building muscle and strength is obviously infamous and tied to, to steroid right. and bodybuilding and most people associate it with that, but it, it has many, many different effects on different physiological systems. Can you give just kind of a brief overview of some of the, the main effects? Yeah, it's absolutely a great question. Best question I've had in a long time. So, so testosterone today, the best doctors out there will literally tell anyone in a lecture, in a classroom setting, um, you know, even their patients that it should be frontline therapy for the number one affliction that is affecting right now men in the world, which is diabetes, which again, as you know, Ari, comes from a sh yeah, an SHITY diet, uh, <laughs> a lack of control of their insulin, because again, they're eating, you know, uh, GMO food, they're eating high sugar, they're drinking a lot of alcohol, whatever, they're doing all kinds of terrible things to their body. So testosterone massively, massively improves uh, insulin sensitivity and also um, suppresses blood glucose. So again, it should be number one frontline uh, treatment for someone that has adult onset, which is again, type two diabetes mellitus. So if you're a guy and you're fat, and you have type two diabetes and your diet sucks and you're not active and you're not doing all these things and you go to a doctor, that literally should be the number one treatment. Um, testosterone also does a number of things um, to lower inflammation, okay? And as you know, inflammation is literally the number one, um, it's the number one reason that people end up with the diseases of aging. Vascular illness, vascular incidents like heart attacks, heart disease, obviously we've already talked about diabetes, and metabolic disorder and obesity, um, neuro, neurodegenerative disease, okay? Testosterone is now, again, I've already mentioned Dr. Mark Gordon, testosterone is now known to help mediate uh, and reduce amyloid plaque, which amyloid plaque, as you know, leads to dementia, Alzheimer's, and other uh, vas uh, vascular neurodegenerative diseases. And by the way, um, and you probably do know this now, but I mean, essentially they're calling now all the neurogenitive disorders of the brain type three diabetes, because again, it affects the same pathways. It increases cytokines, which again, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, which then attack the vascular walls and the cellular walls that are, you know, where the, the plaque and the other things that, again, the cellular gunk that lines up that causes these diseases. So there's so many amazing things that testosterone does. Um, it also obviously helps um, regenerate um, uh, bone. It improves bone mineral density. 
right? Like I just had this conversation with my father who's, you know, anti 74 year old guy, ex pro athlete, totally won't take testosterone. It's illegal. It's unethical. It's immoral, you know? And, and I'm like, dad, you know, he broke his, he broke his right hip and he had like a distal fracture. And I was like, dude, there's one thing that you can do. Okay. Besides red light, besides vibration therapy, besides blah, 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 you know, um, you could take testosterone. I mean, testosterone, there's, you know, a thousand studies out there about what it does to regenerate bone mineral density in 75 year old and older um, geriatric patients. And again, these are people that have compromised immune systems or compromised, um, you know, biological systems from, you know, comorbidities from whatever, and it still regenerates bone. So there's a million things that testosterone does. Again, they're all, you know, he heavily covered in the TOT Bible. Um, I think one of the things that I was blown away at was how potent testosterone is at suppressing inflammatory cytokines. Mm -hmm. And I have all the studies um, that were available to me when I published the book, which was in uh, February of 2018. So, you know, we're almost now 17, 18 months out from there. Um, but I now have in my new books coming up, I have even more studies on inflammation. So they're just finding almost by the day now, the research is coming up to talk about how amazing testosterone is in again, mediating, um, you know, biological systems in, in a positive way. Yeah. Interesting. There are a lot of people concerned with the use of therapeutic testosterone and increased risk of various diseases. Like you see sometimes in the media, people who are saying, Hey, testosterone use is is linked with cardiovascular disease or increased risk of cancer or hair loss or you know prostate cancer and things like that. So what what is your take on these claims and what do you feel the science really says about the use of testosterone and risk for these various conditions? Is it all nonsense that's been overblown or you know can you can you kind of help separate what are the legitimate concerns from the ones that have been false claims this question is regarding therapeutic testosterone and the claims from the media as to whether or not it causes uh diseases or high, increases risk factors for say diseases of the prostate uh, diseases of the vascular system cancer etc what have you so um the truth and again i'll always defer as i have throughout this podcast to my book which is the tot bible anyone can get it on amazon or you can also of course send me and my team and email, at which is contact at trtrevolution.com. We'll send you a copy of the book. I'm actually working on the next book, which is called um, TOT Decoded, The Biohacker's Guide to Utilizing Therapeutic Tea, which is actually going to be much smaller, shorter, streamlined, and even more relevant than the last book was. But anyway, to answer your questions, um, most of the information that is found in the media today in the common perception of people that this therapeutic testosterone causes all these um, terrible um, afflictions, diseases, whatnot, is absolutely patently false. Uh, let's go one by one. So with cardiovascular disease, which is known in the medical community or the clinical space as CBD, um, it's actually the inverse, which is true. And all of the research now, again, in the book, you can also look to Dr. Abraham Morgan Taylor, who's done an amazing job of cataloging all of the research. Um, there's so much overwhelming research that shows that the, um, t when uh, there's an actual cardiovascular issue, it's normally due to a, um, a shortage or a deficiency of testosterone as men are aging. Um, all of the research and the studies that a lot of the attorneys in the past, like in 2014 and 2015, um, that were used to show um, that, you know, men were at higher risk by using therapeutic testosterone were actually done in compromised patient population groups. So, the, you know, that was the Tom trial. There's some other ones out there, but uh, these have all been completely dispelled now. So basically, utilizing therapeutic testosterone is cardioprotective. Okay, that's number one. In regards to the prostate, same thing applies. Um, all of the research that is the most recent and modern and up-to-date research, there's actually a study that just came out in the last week it's mind blowing. It was sent to me by one of my doctors um, showing the modalities of using therapeutic testosterone while men have actually stage one uh, cancer is uh, very, becoming very widespread. But anyway, the old misperception or misnomer that you could not use or that testosterone or therapeutic testosterone caused prostate cancer is 100% patently false. Again, I, I uh, refer you to my book. And again, Dr. Abraham Morgan Taylor, he's done massive amounts of research. There's other men, great doctors and researchers that have proven this, but it's actually the same thing. It's the inverse. So a testosterone deficiency is now known 
to cause um, diseases, uh, benign prostate hypertrophy, and of course, you know, um, initial stage cancers for um, the prostate. So again, it's a testosterone deficiency. Um, in regards to everything else from a side effect profile perspective, I think I said this to you before, but I'll just say it real quick again. Um, there are very, very few side effects when this is done correctly, when done under the care and guidance of a physician who has experience managing both male and female endocrine systems. Um, so, you know, realistically, I can't say that using therapeutic testosterone increases or enhances risk anywhere in otherwise healthy and aging population groups. Okay, so how does body fat figure into this equation of testosterone replacement? Um, if someone is lean or very overweight, does it matter in their considerations of using testosterone or not? Uh, I've heard some suggestions that uh, if you're very overweight, testosterone use can be kind of a double-edged sword because on the one hand, it helps the process of fat loss, but on the other hand, I've heard that it makes you much more likely to have side effects. So what's your take on the use of testosterone and how does body fat, a person's body fat figure into that equation? So a great, great question, uh, Ori. I appreciate you asking this question um, regarding fat, body fat levels and therapeutic testosterone. I'm very, very, I'm a big stickler on this. Um, most of the clinical community, prescribing community gets this wrong and doesn't understand what is going on. So the more body fat that a person has um, before beginning therapeutic testosterone, the more inflamed systemically they are, okay? So if a person is, you know, let's say over 25% body fat and they're not morbidly obese, but they're you know, classified by the BMI index as close to it, um, that most likely means they have a lot of visceral body fat. Visceral body fat is obviously the most inflamed tissue on the human body. And visceral body fat causes cytokine um, expression and response um, to anything that comes into the body. So for example, a person who has a lot of body fat um, is likely testosterone deficient already because, you know, and a lot, you'll get different answer from a lot of different researchers, but sometimes, you know, some people say that it's metabolic disorder and obesity and insulin resistance that cause a testosterone deficiency. And then others will say to you that actually those testosterone deficiency causes the same things too. So it's kind of like that chicken and egg controversy or question. It's difficult to know, but the bottom line is, is that when someone is obese, or carrying too much body fat, it's likely they're going to have a testosterone deficiency. When you inject testosterone as an inflamed high body fat person, the body will normally in most cases, um, again, muster a cytokine response, which is again, a reaction to the inflammatory tissue that's already in the body from the high body fat. And they will demand uh, using testosterone, whether it's injectable or trans, trans uh, scrotal or you know, some form of a you know, skin admission through um, <laughs> putting it on the skin. I, my, my brain's not working right now, but um, a transdermal delivery system, I'm sorry. Um, the, the issue can be that they will have an inflammatory response and that usually processes or presents as high estrogen side effects or symptoms. And that's where most people are confused. And without going into a long esoteric diatribe on the reality of high body fat um, causing high estrogen symptoms. It's not true. The symptoms that they're experiencing are the, prob the problematic reaction and response to the cytokine uh, attack of the testosterone coming into the body, which causes side effects like sensitive nipples, mood imbalances, maybe uh, hot flashes or water retention or something like that, but just kind of like an irritability and imbalance between testosterone and estrogen. And again, that's due to the inflammatory response of the testosterone coming into the body. Um, I've done a lot of podcasts with Dr. Neil Rougier, not a lot, but three really, really high level podcasts discussing this. Also with Dr. Keith Nichols, that I would definitely refer people to watch on my channel if they want to get a lot more information about this. This is very cutting edge. And most physicians right now in the clinical space are not really too much aware of this. Inflammation is starting to become really better understood and well recognized. And this is another example of that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, though, to you, it's okay for a high body fat person to start therapeutic testosterone because testosterone is indeed lipolytic. So it does increase fat burning. It does increase and upregulate thyroid and increase basal metabolic rate slightly. So it's okay for an obese person or a high body fat person to start testosterone, but they should also understand that if they are going to do that, they need to change their lifestyle dramatically 
you know, obviously by, you know, increasing, increasing movement patterning, reducing um, carbohydrates, suppressing their insulin signal, um, you know, drinking more water, obviously, and all the other things that you would, you want, want, a person would want to do to clearly reduce body fat at the same time taking testosterone. So it's a great question. And there's your answer. Okay, so you've talked a lot about the different benefits of the use of testosterone for a lot of different things. Now, is this a panacea? Is this something that you know every guy should take and it just it, it fixes everything? Or what, what's the role of nutrition and lifestyle in this whole picture? And where do you see testosterone therapy as fitting into that context? Great question, my brother, regarding is testosterone a panacea? Testosterone is absolutely not a panacea. I'm very, very big and very outspoken um, of discussing this in all my literature, in all my podcasts. It is part, it's nothing more than an adjunct, an adjunct or an ancillary to what I call a fully dialed in lifestyle. Uh, my next book that's coming out is called Living a Fully Optimized Life, How to Break Free from the Sick Care Medicine System. And, you know, a lot of people look at me as like the pro testosterone guy because I've written the amazing books on it. But truthfully, um, it's about natural optimization. It's about, you know, mediating the biological war on our systems from modern day societal living. There's a lot of other factors at play. Um, so testosterone is not a magic bullet. It is definitely not exercise in a bottle. It is not going to solve all of your problems. However, that said, if you are a man um, who is suffering from a testosterone deficiency, and there are massive amounts of men globally around the world, this is a massive societal-wide epidemic, as you're coming to find out. Guys, even like you, who are in amazing shape, who take great care of themselves, can even have lowered levels of testosterone. And again, this is due to the horrific environmental um, uh, toxicity from chemicals, from particulates in the air that we breathe, from the plastic and the food and the water bo the, the bottles that we eat out of, um, to the endocrine disrupting chemicals that are now cross-linking, you know, according to the research from Dr. Anthony Jay and his amazing book, Extra Generation. So I do personally believe, unless you have supremely elite genetics, you're a type A anal retentive person who massively, um, you know, watches every single step, dots every I, crosses every T, you're likely going to have to be looking at some poor, at some form of clinical intervention of therapeutic testosterone um, at some point in your life. And again, as we see it now, and the doctors, the great doctors I, I speak with on a daily basis, we're seeing this necessary clinical intervention at a much earlier time, even guys in their 20s. Uh, but yes, absolutely, it's definitely, you should definitely look for natural optimization and alleviating you know, all of the risk factors and the things that could cause you to have a testosterone deficiency um, first and foremost. And of course, I'm not a guy that says everybody should be on testosterone. There has to be um, recognized symptomology. And then of course, also backing up um, with lab work and blood work that shows that you have a deficiency. Um, I think we've already talked about, you know, understanding the difference between free testosterone and total testosterone, but it's definitely not a panacea, but it is an amazing life altering uh, medication for men that have a clinical deficiency, which again is the great majority of men around the world now. Um, and obviously again, used in combination with a fully dialed in lifestyle, you can get some tremendous, amazing benefits, increased cognition, better fat loss, of course, better energy, a better sex life. So there's a million, million good reasons to use testosterone. But again, it's not something that's going to solve problems. And especially if a person is not willing to live a fully dialed in lifestyle, it's not going to do very much for them. Talk to me a bit about aromatase inhibitors, because they're obviously very popular in the bodybuilding space, and a lot of people uh, are, are sort of they used to thinking of estrogen as something they need to inhibit and suppress at all times, because estrogen is sort of this feminizing hormone. It does nothing but harm. What's your take on estrogen and aromatase inhibition? Thanks for this question, brother. This is my favorite topic to talk about in the current realm today of uh, testosterone, therapeutic testosterone, and that is aromatase inhibitor medications and estrogen inhibition. Um, I always defer to my good friend and potential uh, business partner down the road, Dr. Robert Komenarik, who is who actually has de delivered amazing research on this and probably the first major lecture. Also in front of him was Dr. Neil Rougier of WorldLink Medical. Both of these guys have done a massive amount of research compiling this data. The majority of the bodybuilding slash scientific slash medical community has this all wrong. And they truly do not understand the benefits and the need of 
estrogen or estradiol, which is again a pleiotropic hormone in obviously male and female endocrine systems, they do not understand the importance of letting estrogen metabolize and the normal estrogen byproducts going through uh, male and female endocrine systems when males or females are using therapeutic testosterone. The inhibition of uh, estrogen, as you already mentioned, is you know an age-old uh, belief that really stems from the bodybuilding cultures where they thought that as a man was increasing his testosterone, especially from a competition and shedding of body fat levels um, viewpoint, you needed to suppress estrogen and increase testosterone. And we now know that that is completely, abjectly, patently false. You should never be suppressing your estrogen with a medication because again, there's so many negative side effects that come from not letting the normal metabolism of estrogen Again, all in the book, all in the many, many podcasts I've done. I definitely highly recommend everybody who follows or watches this podcast to go on my YouTube channel and watch or search the dangers of estrogen inhibition in men on therapeutic testosterone. It was Dr. Rob's lecture and me presenting it uh, in a live uh, webinar format. It's, again, very, very important that people watch that. But you should never suppress estrogen in men undergoing therapeutic testosterone because you just cause so many other downstream effects. You cause brain issues. You cause bone mineral density issues. Um, it also blocks uh, the the uh, the losing or the uh, reducing of uh, uh, visceral body fat. There are so many negative downstream effects of blocking or inhibiting estrogen in men undergoing therapeutic testosterone. It's crazy. And again, the majority of the clinical community has it wrong. They're giving men Arimidex or Anastrozole um, to block the testosterone conversion into uh, um, estrogen or estradiol through the enzyme called aromatase. And it's just all wrong. Um, you know, I haven't done a very good job in this question to you right now in answering this, but I'm very, very passionate about this. People can research what I've written about it. I've got a lot of other videos on there that I've spoken about this, but it is critically, critically important that estrogen is not inhibited. Now, let me just say this. There are, of course, as in everything in medicine, there's always cases and reasons for estrogen inhibition. There are some men out there that are outliers genetically who do over aromatize um, there's also some men that will probably do to their obesity or their nature of having too much body fat will also aromatize. So when you do use an aromatase inhibitor as a medic, um, a physician or as a clinician, um, you would want to use it in the minimum effective dosage necessary and titrate off as soon as possible. Again, because you do not want to be blocking all of the amazing, um, you know, uh, re the, the amazing downstream benefits of, um, estrogen metabolizing as a pleiotropic hormone. And again, highly recommend that they, everybody who watches this, our video, watches that video that's on my channel that Dr. Rob and I, because it's a very deep dissection of why you do not want to block estrogen in men undergoing therapeutic testosterone. Okay, I know there are a lot of different delivery methods out there for using testosterone. So you can use injectable, obviously that's been around for a very long time, but there are some other methods that have come on the market. You know, you, there, there's andro gel, there's you know, this gel that you rub on your skin. Uh, I believe there's some oral versions as well. There's pellets that you get installed surgically, I believe, or put into your body surgically. Uh, and there's some other methods. So give me the rundown of what the different methods are and which are the methods that you recommend? So this is a great question, Ari. Um, so this is regarding to um, delivery systems for therapeutic testosterone. So there are numerous delivery systems in the current marketplace as we do this podcast in June of 2019. However, there are, in my opinion, only two that are reliable and worthy and not going to cause you know potential side effects or issues down the road. Now, before I say those two things, any good clinician, if asked, what is the best delivery system of therapeutic testosterone, and they, that person, he or she will say, the one that the patient adheres to, right? So for example, there are military people, there are people that have you know, very highly special, specialized government jobs uh, who may or may not be in harm's way and in places where they cannot travel regularly or inject themselves or rub cream on themselves or whatever. So for those type of people, I would definitely say that uh, therapeutic testosterone is better than no therapeutic testosterone. Again, when there's a need, which of course, as we've already said in this podcast, millions, if not hundreds of millions of people do have a need for it today. Um, but 
there's a bunch of stuff, dude. There's like you said, there's bucles in the mouth. There's nasal spray in the testo. There's pellets, which are surgically implanted. Um, there's patches, skin patches. And then there's other ones too. Now you said there's oral, there's Jitenzo, there's Clorenzo. There's a bunch of new products that are coming into the marketplace, but all of them are fraught with side effects, fraught with issues, fraught with other stuff that we don't need to discuss here in this podcast right now. Again, in my book, the TOT Bible, they're all broken down, highly discussed, highly dissected. But in my opinion today, right now, there are two delivery systems. They're both very close to each other. It's just going to, again, come down to patient adherence. Um, and lifestyle convenience. The first one I would say would be um, injectable, the tried and true method. Um, injectable delivery systems have been around forever, literally. I mean, since way before men were even studying testosterone, probably since like the 40s and 50s when the Russians and the Bulgarians were using injectable testosterone. Um, but the best way to administer injectable testosterone is threefold. Number one is daily. Okay, because daily mimics the body's natural production as close as possible. You have a, pul a small pulsatile uh, diurnal release of testosterone normally as you're aging. And if you inject yourself daily with testosterone, it is going to mimic the body's natural production the best. Okay, the second and third would be every other day. Again, second and third being most convenient or most um, best option. Um, so every other day would be like three days a week out of a seven day week or four days out of a seven day week, depending on how you do it. Most men who do three days a week usually just do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, and then leave themselves error margin again, depending if life gets in the way. And then the third um, recommended, but not to me, you know, I would say one and two every other day or daily for injections is best. Um, but the third option would be twice a week. Now, why third is not the best because a lot of men do have, you know, quote unquote, a needle phobia. Um, at, at the initial onset of starting uh, therapeutic testosterone. Everyone overcomes needle phobia. These are not big needles. They're very thin, you know, s uh, slender gauge, 27, 28, even 29, 30, which are insulin size gauges. They don't hurt when you inject them. You can inject yourself arms, legs, buttock, gluteal fat pad, lower abs, whatever. Um, but the issue becomes it has, it has something to do with half-lives, right? Like when, you, when the testosterone ester cleaves in the body's uh, bloodstream, um, the half-life, depending on the ester, and we don't have to go into esters here because at the end of the day, testosterone cleaves into bioidentical testosterone. So all of the different esters all get to the same place once they cleave in the bloodstream. Some cleave faster than others. But the half-life, when you're doing it twice a week, is you're going to come down to like day three or day four before your second shot, and you're going to start feeling a little bit down because, again, you're having a peak and a trial. When you do it daily or every other day, there's never any trials. It's always usually a peak or it's just kind of like a steady state where it just kind of stays elevated. So you feel better. And then obviously you also don't have any biological perturbations because you're not having, you know, dropping down and then going back up or any of that stuff, which does cause, um, you know, differentiation. So the second delivery system, and this is the one that I'm currently on now because I was on therapeutic testosterone for 19 years, injectable wise. And I've recently switched um, due to my physician, Dr. Keith Nichols, which is transcrotal. And um, the scrotum, at the base of the man's scrotum, the skin is very, very permeable, very, very thin. And there's actually research out there that shows that the uh, absorption of a transcrotal testosterone cream, again, 200 milligrams per gram. This is not gel. This is compounded cream, versa base, HRT base, or there's a new version called atrivaceous, which is actually some sort of a liposomal delivery system. So again, a pharmaceutical company's way to increase the cost of transdermal testosterone cream. I don't think it's any better, you know, and, and user feedback. I haven't used it personally, but user feedback says it's not either. Um, but that on the, on the base of the scrotum, after you shower and shave early in the morning is great. I've been doing it now for almost 10 months and I love it. Um, it definitely is a little bit, in my opinion, better than injections um, for men that are in like monogamous relationships for a long time, because um, when you put it on the base of the scrotum, you do get an increased DHT, which is dihydrotestosterone signal, which increase you know is a little bit more androgenic, a little bit more um, increases sexual function or enhances sexual function. You definitely will get slightly better um, erections or erectile strength and quality. Um, so, but between those two options, you know, trans, trans, transdermal on the base of the scrotum and then injectable, meaning either daily, every other day or twice a week, those are your best options from a delivery system standpoint. Okay. Final question. What is the best approach for someone to start using testosterone optimization therapy? Should they just sort of go online right now 
and you know, try to find VersaBase cream or get some injectable testosterone and just start injecting it? Uh, how, how, how do they go about this process and do they need to seek out special doctors in order to do this? Uh, is there anything they need to know about what kind of doctors to avoid? So what's, what's sort of like the step-by-step -step practical guide for someone to figure out if testosterone optimization therapy is right for them and how to get started in a smart way so that they don't screw themselves up? All right, great question. So the last question is, how does a person who's watching this podcast who becomes informed, what do they do now to seek out whether or not they need testosterone optimization therapy? So it is, it is a good question. Um, you definitely, in my opinion, cannot rely on your quote unquote primary care physician, your you know, family doctor or a GP. You have to seek out a physician who is highly specialized in managing uh, both male and female endocrine systems. And we, you know, this podcast has mostly been about men, but obviously women can use therapeutic testosterone too. That's a whole other topic, but yes, both of us work well. Um, to limit the diseases of aging utilizing therapeutic testosterone, but uh, you definitely need to seek out a physician who knows what they're doing. The majority of doctors who do prescribe testosterone and other hormones have no idea what they're doing. And again, I'm not disparaging the clinical space or the community. I have many, many doctors I work with. I love the majority of doctors. I know that the majority of them, if not all of them, do intend to help. Um, but when they have such little knowledge of this because they don't learn anything in medical school, there is no first you know, there's no standard patient of care for hormone optimization. This is a highly nuanced, highly niched field. Um, and it's full of people that are attempting to make money like every other person in the world who has mortgages and bills to pay. But you should definitely focus on working with a physician that knows what they're doing. Now, the other issue that you have is there's a lot of testosterone windmill clinics, as I call them out there, that, you know, just sell you a, a per month cost of like testosterone and HCG and NAI and blah, 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 and value add, value add, value add. Those also should be avoided because a lot of those places are cookie cutter and they're templatizing their hormone optimization. And every person, male and female, is a unique, biochemically unique individual, okay? So understanding that you're biochemically unique means that when you go on these, these hormone therapies, your response is not gonna be the same as mine. Ari's response is not gonna be the same as mine. My response is not gonna be the same as Ari's. So the bottom line is you must, it's absolutely mandatory imperative work with a physician who has a length of time you know, and, and, and a body of work, an experiential-based practice of managing male and female endocrine systems. You know, I could mention a bunch of different doctors, but the problem is right now, is there's no like universal governing website that recommends like the top people. Sure, if you're in LA, San Diego, where you're at, or, or New York, or Miami, or Seattle, or you know, Atlanta, or Dallas or Houston or any of the major metros, you could go online and Google, you know, HRT, TRT, TOT, whatever, and you'll get a million, literally, doctors that will come up that can, you know, technically help you. Um, do your homework, man. You know, I highly, highly recommend that anyone that's considering doing this reads my book first. I'm not saying that as a shill. It's by far the best book ever written on this. It's written for lay people. Um, it's not written in like highly, you know, clinical, technical doctor speak. There is that in there for clinicians. And of course, you know, literally thousands of doctors around the world have read the book and even enlighten themselves and become further educated. But you must educate yourself and become what I call situationally aware uh, of how this works before starting down the clinical path. Because I'm telling you, man, the majority of people go into this expecting to be optimized and it gets worse because they're working with people that really can't help them. So you can definitely start off by yourself though, by going to a private lab, like, and again, I have no financial incentive by mentioning names, but discountedlabs.com, privatemdlabs.com, directlabs.com. These are for people in North America. There's a lot of them out there. There's a bunch of ones I haven't mentioned. You don't need a doctor's prescription or permission. You can just go online, get a total testosterone, a sensitive estradiol LCMS pool. Um, and then you can, of course, do bigger lab work, anti-aging panels, wellness, pre-hormone panels. I mean, all of these things are very, very lucidly and uh, discussed and dissected in the TOT Bible. I even give you like a cheat sheet of like the lab panels and the biomarkers to be aware of, to track, to measure, how to read them, how to understand them. Um, so that's the most important thing. Like going down this path without educating yourself is a very, very poor decision. It's very imprudent. You will likely 
um, get messed up. You will likely, you know, work with a physician that cannot help you. And again, they're not trying or attempting to um, not help you. They just don't know what they're doing. I mean, there's a lot of different people out there. You can Google this and read on, you know, various men's, men's forums and stuff like that, that poor experiences that a lot of people have. So again, I highly recommend that you educate yourself. You know, you follow my channel, my, my YouTube channel. There's amazing physicians, the top doctors in the world. I'm interviewing them all the time. Uh, every Wednesday at 4 p.m., you know, I have my podcast, The Optimized Life. Last year, I had the doctor's roundtable where I interviewed like the best doctors. We ask all these questions. So essentially, if you read my book and you follow the production and the creativity and all the content that is going out there, you will likely become highly educated and able to avoid the pitfalls um, of, you know, many people, um, you know, in the clinical space who are pr prescribing hormones who don't know what they're doing. So Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jay. I really appreciate your time. You're a wealth of knowledge. Really, really enjoyed this interview. And I hope to connect with you again in the very near future. Thank you very much. Dude, I appreciate being on your podcast. It was absolutely epic. I hope that this informs and educates people to the highest level. As always, I'm very available to people. Um, you can send an email to my team, contact at trtrevolution.com. And I will, or one of my, actually I won't, but my team will send out the, a copy of the TOT Bible PDF. They also send out my book on fasting. Um, and then we send out relevant articles and podcasts that I've done, like in the, you know, very relevant, very recent, that will inform people to the highest level. So again, Ari, man, my brother, I love you, man. Thank you so much for having me on your show. And I can't wait to do this again. Take care. Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go. Just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Energy Blueprint, and also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. Hope you guys enjoyed this interview, and I will see you again next week.